first speaker this morning is Professor No Vin Long. Born in 1944 in the Bac Ninh province near Saigon, Long worked as a map maker for the U.S. military in Vietnam from 1959 until 1962. After witnessing tremendous suffering in the countryside during what was known as the Tr Strategic Hamlet Program, he resigned from his job, returned to Saigon, and started organizing student demonstrations against the Vietnamese government. In 1963, he was asked to leave the country, and CIA officials assisted him in enrolling in school here in the United States for seven months. In 1964, he returned to Vietnam and resumed organizing student demonstrations against the government. With his life in danger, Professor Long was accepted to Harvard University with a full scholarship. The South Vietnamese government first refused to let him leave the, gov the country, but later relented. After coming to Boston in 1964, Long joined the fledgling anti-war movement here. He was the first Vietnamese American to speak out openly against the war and against U.S. foreign policy. He toured the United States on an anti-war lecture circuit with Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, and others. Long received his Ph.D. in East Asian History and Far Eastern Languages from Harvard University in 1978. He became a U.S. citizen in 1991. He's been a history professor at the University of Maine since 1985. He's the author of the book, Before the Revolution, The Vietnamese Peasants Under the French, Vietnamese Women in Society and Revolution, The French Colonial Period, co-author of Agriculture and Rural Society in the Period of Industrialization and Modernization, which is a book published in Vietnam in 1997. And he's also co-editor of the book, Coming to Terms, Indochi Indochina, the United States, and the War, published in 1991. This morning, Professor Long will reflect on his personal experiences as a military map maker with the American counterinsurgency effort in South Vietnam and shed some light on what counterinsurgency really means. Please, please welcome Professor No Vin Long. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, I would like to thank the sponsors, uh, the organizers uh, of this event, as well as all of you for uh, uh, being here. Uh, I had the opportunity of speaking in uh, this auditorium many times in the past, so this is a very, fam very familiar place to me. Uh, and MIT was a very special place for me, partly because of my friendship with many people here. Uh, one of them is Professor Chomsky here uh, sitting on the, in, uh, uh, on the podium. In fact, it was Professor Chomsky who introduced my, the, my first book manuscript to MIT, which was published in 1973. That book manuscript had been um, delayed or, or kept at the Harvard uh, University Press for, uh, for three years. And so we retrieved it, and we got it to MIT, and MIT published it promptly. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, in fact, he also introduced uh, other manuscripts of mine, one of which was an 800-page uh, study uh, of the Vietnamese rural area during the French colonial period. Uh, and MIT was going to, be, to publish it when I got a book contract by Random House, Pantheon Books, and I went to Vietnam uh, for seven months. After I got back from Vietnam, there were attempts on my life, and I was not able to turn the book manuscript into MIT in time. When I uh, the revision, when I, I did at the MIT uh, Humanities uh, uh, branch of the MIT Press, uh, went belly up. Uh, and the same thing happened to my Pantheon books. By the time I finished that book, Pantheon also went belly up. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you this story not uh, to say that to warn publishers who associated me with go bellying up, uh, but uh, to say that, you know, personally, I myself, because you want me to talk on a personal level, uh, have had to deal with, with many uh, pressing issues, and I decided that scholarship can be pushed aside. And one of uh, the urgent issues that I've had to deal with in the last 30 years is to confront the incredible rewriting of history 
uh, of the history of the Vietnam War uh, on both sides of the Pacific, in Vietnam as well as in, his, in here in this country. I'm not going to talk about the revision of history in Vietnam, but what I want to say is that interestingly enough, the official lines in Vietnam uh, and the official lines here in this country converged after the war ended. Uh, particularly the fact that, you know, the United States claimed that the war in Vietnam were created, uh, or the aggression, the communist aggression in Vietnam was started by the communist north, uh, and the communist uh, uh, um, government in the north was responsible for uh, uh, only destruction and victory or whatever in the south. Uh, and interestingly enough, the, the regime in, uh, the, the current regime in Vietnam for the last 30 years also want to claim that the lion's share for the victory in Vietnam was uh, 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 because of Northern co uh, contribution. Uh, and so, you know, uh, when, you, when you try to uh, confront the rewriting of history on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, you get fired at on, on, on both sides, and so you really have to spend a tremendous amount of time uh, dealing with that. Having said that, uh, today I'm only uh, going to talk about part of the rewriting of history here in this country and not deal with Vietnam. Uh, the rewriting in his, uh, of history in this country uh, started, you know, on the very day that Saigon uh, uh, fell. And Kissinger went on TV right away saying that, you know, uh, the reason why uh, there was the loss of Vietnam was because, uh, not only because of peace movement uh, and Congress betraying uh, the American effort, but also because the North Vietnamese uh, got tremendous amount of aid from China and the Soviet Union uh, um, uh, during the last uh, two years after the signing of the Paris Agreement, and that was why the war in Vietnam was lost. Uh, and, um, and so forth and so on. Uh, and now, you see, uh, to the extent that now, they, you know, people in power can make any kind of statement they want uh, to say about the Vietnam War. For example, if you remember two months ago during the election in Iraq, uh, President um, um, Bush stated that, you know, we are going to win in Iraq now because the Iraqi people really love freedom and democracy, not like the South Vietnamese. And the South Vietnamese never wanted to fight for freedom and democracy. That's why we lost the war. <laughs> I don't know how many people remember that kind of statement. It was precisely because of the Vietnamese struggle for freedom and independence and democracy, and that's why the United States lost the war. Uh, But never mind about that. You know, what I want to do today is to focus on one small issue. Uh, it's not small at that, but one narrow issue, and that's counterinsurgency. Because, you know, in the last two years, uh, we, almost every day we hear about counterinsurgency as if this is a, a new magical weapon that, you know, that the United States is going to use, uh, uh, has been using in Iraq and the Middle East, and somehow we are going to win this time. It's not like Vietnam. You know, and you know, almost every week we hear the story about Iraq is not Vietnam. Of course we know that Iraq is not Vietnam. Uh, it, it doesn't take that much intelligence to know that Iraq is not Vietnam. The question is, is whether American strategies and tactics used in Iraq are the same as those in Vietnam. And counterinsurgency was not invented in the last two years. Counterinsurgency was invented you know, at least as early as 1952. But to make the story short, uh, it was applied in Vietnam as soon as the uh, Geneva Agreement ended in 1954. And the United States right away uh, sent uh, its generals into Vietnam to try to uh, conduct a counterinsurgency program against the former Viet Minh. Uh, uh, cadres in the South Viet Minh stands for the League of uh, uh, Independence for Vietnam. Uh, and uh, at that time, they did not call counterinsurgency, they called pacification program. 
uh, and the pacification program uh, uh, was started uh, in November of 1954. Uh, the U.S. Joint Chief of Staff ordered uh, the prompt reassignment of selected personnel and units to maintain, and I quote, the security of the legal government in Saigon and other major population centers and execute regional security operations in each province and perform territorial pacification missions. Uh, so how was this uh, territorial uh, 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 pacification mission was carried about? Incredible assassination and killing of people at, at, at the local level. Uh, of course, I was too young at that time. I didn't, I, I didn't uh, uh, know about that, but I did read about that. And in the Saigon newspapers, for example, they talk about you know, how many you know, communists they kill on a daily basis. So by 1956, uh, 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 the Saigon regime launched with U.S. aid tremendous amount of money and weapons, what was known as Phong Trao Tô Tông, the Communist Denunciation Campaign. Uh, and uh, the Communist Denunciation Campaign was also the, 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 the campaign to annihilate the communists. And at that time, they invented a term, Viet Cong. Actually, you see, uh, uh, according to uh, um, the former director of, of, of propaganda in Vietnam, uh, Nguyen Văn Châu. Nguyen Văn Châu said that he, he coined the word, uh, and the word was Viet Cong. Viet Cong, Viet Cong pronounced in Vietnamese, South Vietnamese pronunciation is Viet Cong. Viet Cong also means to annihilate the communists. And so that was what the program was all about. Well, Saigon, in May of 1956, the Saigon government officially announced that 100,000 former Viet Minh cadres in the South had, quote unquote, rallied to the government or surrender, and tens of thousands had been executed or sent to, quote unquote, re education camps, i.e., prisons. In spite of this fact, Hanoi forbade the people in the South to fight back because Hanoi was counting on the fact that for some reason the United States would allow free and fair election to be carried out uh, according to the Geneva Accords so that the country could then be reunified peacefully. Uh, the United States, however, you know, stated many times during that period that you know, if free and fair elections were to be carried out under international supervision, then the Viet Minh would win by at least 80% or 90% of the votes. So therefore, you, know, you should not allow the free and fair election to come about. Uh, uh, and in order to be able to uh, uh, maintain this quote-unquote legal government itself, you have to kill the communists. And that's later on, in, by 1959, was known as counter-insurgency, counter but not by this time. Now, uh, because Hanoi was responsible, in part, for not allowing the people in the South to fight back, tens of thousands of people were killed because the, the military branch of the Viet Minh had moved north with all their weapons, all the, most of the weapons. The, the people who remained in the South were political cadres. So for years, you know, in, in Vietnam, uh, the official uh, uh, line was not to talk about the casualties in the South during uh, the early period of the regime, regime uh, for fear that, you see, people would, uh, would blame the North for having allowed this to happen. However, by 1995, Hanoi uh, had to uh, admit in a, a book entitled uh, The Overall Assessment of the War by the Central Command of the Overall Assessment of the War uh, uh, of the Political Bureau of the Vietnamese Communist Party. This is a mouthful. Uh, uh, Anyway, the, uh, the book admitted that about 90% of all political, uh, 
party members in the South had been killed by 1959. In the Mekong Delta alone, 70,000 party cadres had been killed. Over 90,000 other party members and local inhabitants had been arrested, jailed, and tortured. In the central provinces, 40% of all provincial cadres had been killed, 60% of all district cadres, and 70% of all village cadres also had been killed. In some provinces, only two to three cadres remained. Only in uh, uh, Tri Thien, which means uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, combined provinces of, of, of Quang Tri and Tri Thien, did 160 of the former 23,400 cadres survive. This was the extent of the killing at that time. The people in the South was forced to resist. And so in January of 1959, uh, in Hanoi, uh, the, fifth, uh, the 15th plenum of the, of the Communist of, of the of the party in Hanoi uh, met, and out of that came uh, uh, the resolution allowing the southern population to use force to defend themselves with the added emphasis that only when absolutely necessary. That was the emphasis. So the people in the South, of course, re regarded that the situation was abs absolutely, it was absolutely necessary for them to, uh, uh, to fight back. Uh, and so they took up arms uh, and began to fight back. And many districts in uh, the southern part of Vietnam in the, in the Mekong Delta were liberated during this point. In the United States, Senator Kennedy was running for uh, uh, campaigning for the presidency and his military advisor was uh, General Maxwell D. Taylor. Maxwell D. Taylor was a strong advocate of counterinsurgency. Uh, and uh, uh, he believed that the United States should enhance what was known as a special forces capability to deal with counterinsurgency everywhere in the world. He published a book entitled The Uncertain Trumpet in 1959, uh, which Kennedy used as his foreign policy platform. Uh, and Taylor and, uh, uh, argued that the United States should place, uh, uh, that the United States had placed too much emphasis on uh, uh, nuclear deterrence, uh, and uh, as, as a result, uh, 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 the communists were exploiting American uh, weaknesses everywhere, especially in the third world. So the United States should, able, uh, should develop counterinsurgency capability, which was also known as limited war capability to fight against the insurgents. Uh, and, and insurgency was also known as domestic aggression. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because, you see, uh, uh, General Maxwell Taylor was chief of the army, and there was a tough war between the army and the Navy and the Air Force. Because, you see, uh, massive deterrence as a policy meant that, you, that the United States were putting in a lot of money in the Navy, uh, into the Navy, into, into the Air Force, so that they could have this delivery capability for nuclear weapons and so on and so on. Uh, that left the Army out. And as far as the Army was concerned, you see, uh, after you have a war, then what, 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 what's the role of the Army? Come in and clean up the mess? No, sir, we want an active part in this thing, too. And so the, the tough war in Vietnam became a real war. Uh, the tough war in the United States became a real war in Vietnam. When Kennedy became president, he, uh, he adopted counterinsurgency as a policy. Uh, and he began to send massive number of so-called advisors to Vietnam. Most of the advisors were special forces people. Uh, now, I also happened to, at this point, to 
uh, be employed by one of the branches of this counter urgency agency. And uh, I was a very young man. I was 16. I didn't know anything about this. Uh, you know, and what I wanted to do was to be able to travel around the country. And at that time, you, know, you could not travel around the country. I mean, there was kind of like a, an internal, uh, um, how is it, uh, in order to go from one district to another district, you have to have a passport, uh, an internal passport in order to uh, do travel. And I wanted, to, I wanted to find out what Vietnam was like. So this was an opportunity for me. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, owned, uh, I happened to meet some of these generals at, at an exclusive club in Saigon, the Sesportif. And I said, you know, I mean, you are hiring Filipinos and Japanese and these people, and they don't know about Vietnam. Uh, they are apt to get themselves killed. Uh, and two months later, two Filipinos were killed in the Mekong Delta. Uh, and so they got back to me and said, hey, you know, how do you know about this? Uh, so you want to work for us. And so uh, at a very young age, I worked for the United States, uh, uh, making military maps. But there were making different kinds of military maps then. Ours was the most, the least obnoxious thing because we were basically yeah, uh, uh, making military maps, but there were also another part, which was making maps of villages. And the, the people who were making maps of villages were the people who were really engaged in counterinsurgency. Uh, Counterinsurgency included pacification, it included population control, uh, uh, it included uh, 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 and population control and counterinsurgency and pacification. Uh, all these things, they used different kinds of methods. For example, there was what was known as an anti-malarial uh, 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 di uh, disease program. They had people going throughout the country, spraying people's houses, and, uh, you know. And so people had this thing, uh, how do you say that? And they go to people's house, take things out of the house, spray. And when, when they took things out of the house, they tried to find out whether there were subversive literature and this kind of thing. Uh, and then a week or two later, you know, those people who were considered suspect were caught it off. And... Uh, I found out very quickly that this is what happened. As soon as an anti-malarial uh, team goes through a village, then a couple of weeks later, people were arrested and killed. Uh, and then, of course, they had doctors and engineers and agricultural exports and uh, civic teams of all kinds going through the villages. Uh, and you would think that they were doing nice things. Uh, a lot of the time, they were carrying out this pacification program of counterinsurgency. Uh, and then when uh, the suffering was too much and people started to fight back, they decided that you have to control the population. So they began what was known as the Kui Khu Kui Up, which means areas, big areas where the they put people, you know, in, uh, they tried to separate the bad apples from the good apples, so to speak. Uh, and that failed. So, in, uh, so they started, you know, uh, what was known as the agroville. And you know, again, uh, agroville is a French word, means agricultural city or something like that, when you mass a lot of villages together and control them. Excuse me. Uh, uh, and that failed. And then, you know, by 1961, they started what was known as a strategic hamlet. And the strategic ha hamlet, typically had 100 families in each with stockade, barbed wire fences, spike moats and around, soldiers guarding the, different, the four corners of a strategic hamlet. People were not allowed to leave a hamlet uh, at, uh, after a certain time in the evening and, and was not, uh, 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 before a certain time in the evening, was not allowed to come back a certain time in the, af in the afternoon. Uh, they were moved very far away from the paddy fields and farms. And as a result, in many areas, especially in central, central part of Vietnam, there were mass, massive starvation. Uh, and I have documented this thing, thing in detail in, in, in many articles and books. I don't want to go into that, that here. But when I protested, you know, uh, to my higher up, saying that, you know, you are, you are making people suffer, 
suffer. You are producing more commonness, you know, than you are uh, 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 an enemy and so forth and so on. People said, Long, you're very naive. This is how we defeat the commonness in Malaysia. This is how we defeated them in the Philippines. And by golly, we are going to defeat them in Vietnam too, uh, very, very quickly. Well, it turned out that that was not the case. So, uh, again, to make the story short, they had to escalate the pacification program and counterinsurgency because by 1963, when 80% of the rural population in, in the Mekong Delta, for example, were grouped into these strategic hamlets, uh, the Jim regime uh, was confronted with tremendous popular uh, 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 opposition, not only in the countryside, but also in the cities by Buddhist students and so forth and so on. The United States decided that Jim had become a liability, so the United States uh, uh, supported a coup, if not to say staged it, uh, and uh, uh, by November of 1963, Jim died, was killed. When Jim was killed, the pacification program totally collapsed. Most of uh, the strategic hamlets had been uh, dismantled. And there was nothing the United States could do for two years. So finally, the United States had to send American Marines into Vietnam in March of 1965. And there has been a lot of controversy in this country about how we did not have troops built up in Vietnam fast enough, you know. Uh, but you see, troops built up in Vietnam was much faster than troops built up in the first Gulf War and Iraq War in terms of numbers. Uh, and when American troops went to Vietnam, most of their efforts went into pacification, uh, as well as the efforts of the South Vietnamese uh, uh, soldiers. And pacification, again, is counterinsurgency. The idea is, here is this, and put people on this new, now they call it new life hamlet. They don't call it strategic hamlet, they call it new life hamlet. As presumably that you, see you would have a new life if you get put into these concentration camps. And they call it up Tân Sin. Tân Sin is, 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 is a Sino-Vietnamese word. And so when there was tremendous resistance on the part of the Vietnamese, they decided that maybe that Sino-Vietnamese word, uh, uh, the people of Vietnam couldn't understand, so they changed it into uh, colloquial Vietnamese. They call it up Đời Mới which means the same thing, uh, which means new life hamlet. But they translated back into English, they call it the new, new life hamlet, <laughs> uh, if you remember. And, and there were professors here at, the university, uh, at, 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 at MIT, you know, who supported this program, if you remember. Uh, professor Chomsky talked about this, you know, and professor at Harvard, too. One of my professors at Harvard was Sam Huntington, uh, uh, you know, supported this pacification program and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, I want to want, uh, uh, wouldn't talk about it later. Uh, again, to make the story short, by 1972, this massive counterinsurgency program, which, uh, I mean, from, from 1965 to 1972, this massive counterinsurgency program was directed basically against the civilian population in Vietnam. Uh, or as an American general said it, you know, by Gongli, you know, if uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the Viet Cong are just like fish swimming in water, you know, which is the population, and then by Gongli, we are going to uh, dry up the ocean, uh, but, uh, but in the sea, then we, we are going to dry up the sea. And so they, 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 they uh, put people in this uh, uh, new, new life hamlet uh, and, and, and made refugees out of millions of people. By 1972, according to official U.S. sources, about 12 million people out of a total population of 18 million people had been made refugees and many of them will live in refugee camps and in this new, new life hamlet. And that was the extent of counterinsurgency in Vietnam. Uh, and of course, you see, if you look at, uh, at figures of, of, of casualties, uh, the Vietnamese claim eventually after 30 years, uh, actually the claim about uh, 25 years ago, that there were three million Vietnamese killed uh, in the war, most of them in the South and the majority of people who were killed in South were civilians. Uh, and that was counterinsurgency. Uh, let me uh, now uh, try to link it to what is happening now here, here uh, in Iraq. They are talking about counterinsurgency. 
And they think that this time it's different because the resistance in Iraq is not as strong as in Vietnam. And so, you know, we win. As if winning or victory would justify what they are doing to the people in Iraq. What I'm trying to say is that they managed to kill most of the revolutionaries in, uh, uh, already from the period from 1954 to 1956 or 57. But because of the suffering of the people in the South, the people in the South fought back. They did not have to receive uh, orders from the North. In fact, the, the North forbade them to to, to, to fight back. So my question is, how much of the suffering that is being um, uh, 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 is caused, uh, is being imposed on the Iraqi people, you know, uh, would make the, uh, whether the suffering or, you know, that's being imposed on the people in Iraq would not make them take up arms and fight back. Uh, uh, whether you have uh, uh, support from Syria or Iran or whatever or not. Uh, and, uh, uh, and even if they, you know, I mean, they were to be defeated, the question is whether that's right or not. We, we, uh, we hear so little about the suffering, you know, that the, casual, the civilian population in, in Iraq you know, uh, have to endure. Uh, every day we hear that there's, you know, some terrorists blow up some American trucks here and there and that kind of thing. This kind of body counts. But what about civilian population there? And, and the suffering there, you know, whether that would fit into the, the quote-unquote insurgency or not. And, and if, if it does, then would the United States uh, uh, be able to withdraw from Iraq very, very, uh, very soon, as Bush says, or whether the United States will stay in there for a much longer time, imposing more suffering on the people of Iraq. Yeah. So, if there is anything that we can learn from Vietnam, is that you should not underestimate nationalism, and you should not underestimate people's desire for freedom and independence and democracy and all of that. They are going to fight back because these, these are good values, it's the values that they, uh, uh, that, that they, they prize and not, and not because uh, they are afraid of uh, uh, all the destruction caused by the United States. Uh, let me stop there, and then we can talk about things later. Uh, l let me make one, one proposal to amend uh, what Linda said, is that instead of, m of me answering question now, let, I mean, let me suggest let Professor Chomsky talk first, and the two of us would answer your questions after he, he gave his uh, talk. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'm not the boss after all. That's fine. That's okay. No bosses. Next, I'm honored to introduce Noam Chomsky, who's well known around these parts. He's been a professor here at MIT since 1955. He's, he was one of the first intellectuals to speak out against the Vietnam War in this country and risked his career in order to protest actively against the war. His views about the Vietnam War received national prominence in 1967 with the publication of his essay, The Responsibility of in Intellectuals, in the New York Review of Books. Among his books touching on Vietnam, three of the most well-known are American Power and the New Mandarins, published in 1969, At War with Asia in 1970, and after the cataclysm, post-war into China and the reconstruction of imperial ideology, co-authored with Edward Herman and published in 1979. Of course, as we all know, Professor Chomsky has written about a wide variety of other topics as well. The brilliant author and activist from India, Arundhati Roy, wrote these words about Chomsky in 2003. Quote, the magnitude and intensity of Chomsky's work is a barometer of the magnitude, scope, and relentlessness of the propaganda machine that he's up against. 
He's like the wood borer who lives inside the third rack of my bookshelf. Day and night, I hear his jaws crunching through the wood, grinding it to a fine dust. It's as though he disagrees with the literature and wants to destroy the very structure on which it rests. I call him Chomsky. <laughs> Please welcome Professor Noam Chomsky. some time, I could describe what I might write in my memoir someday about some other experiences that I had uh, with book publishing in uh, the MIT Press, which I think Long knows about. Uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the people of Indochina, the issue of crucial significance uh, is uh, what happened to them during to these uh, ravaged countries during uh, one of the worst, if not the worst, uh, uh, war crime of the post-Second World War era, horrendous assault upon a civilian population, primarily South Vietnam, as Long pointed out. Uh, for the world, what's of crucial significance is how these crimes are interpreted in the aggressor state, namely us. Uh, that question, in part, is pretty easy to answer for intellectual elites in the United States, for the communities in which we live. Uh, it's pretty easy to determine. There's a huge published record. And it, uh, there's a certain spectrum. I won't talk about the right wing. Much more interesting is the uh, uh, dissident extreme that is permitted within the mainstream. So there's no one more extreme than uh, Anthony Lewis in the New York Times. Uh, at the end of the war in 1975, he wrote a retrospective in which he said that uh, uh, the war began with, uh, 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 with benign intentions, uh, with blundering, intention, blundering efforts to do good. That's how it began. But by 19, the kind of thing that Long was just describing, uh, but by 1969, uh, it had become clear that it was a mistake that was too costly for us. Uh, that's the extreme end. Uh, why 1969? Well, because that was about a year and a half after the business community in the United States had turned against the war. Uh, partly because they regarded it as too costly to the United States, and partly because they recognized what I think is true, that the basic war, that the war, that the U.S. had basically won the war in terms of its major war aims, so there wasn't any point going on. Uh, 1960, uh, we do also know something about public opinion. So, for example, in 1969, uh, when the extreme dissident end was able to conceive that the blundering efforts to do good may have become too costly to us. Uh, at that, uh, in 1969, about 70 percent of the population of the United States uh, regarded the war as, um, the words of the polls, uh, not a mistake, but fundamentally wrong and immoral. If you want to do uh, numbers which incidentally are sustained up until the, uh, the most recent polls just a few years ago roughly 70 percent. Uh, you might do a research project to see if any words like that, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, appear anywhere uh, within anything like mainstream literature, uh, press, uh, scholarship, uh, virtually anything. But it does happen to be the opinion of the vast majority of the population, uh, and the numbers are pretty striking because these are people who've never heard it. Uh, those results are never reported. And presumably everyone thinks I'm the only crazy person who thinks this. Uh, and it's important that results not be important reported uh, so that uh, people will feel uh, isolated and helpless and so on. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, uh, why did the business press uh, believe that the war had basically been won by 1969? 
Uh, it's an unusual view. The usual story is the U.S. lost. In fact, that's uh, supposed to be a terrible loss. Well, whether the U.S. won or lost depends on which war aims you're looking at. Um, there were maximal aims and there were basic aims. The maximal aims were to turn uh, Indochina into uh, actually what was described as the model, uh, described openly as the model, namely Indonesia after 1965. Uh, in Indonesia in 1965, uh, U.S. backed, partly instigated military coup led by General Suharto. It killed about maybe a million people, mostly landless peasants, uh, wiped out the only mass-based political party in the country, instituted a regime of uh, torture and oppression and violence. It was called by the CIA one of the worst mass murders of the 20th century. They compared it to Hitler and Stalin. Uh, it was called, it wasn't concealed here. The New York Times described it as a staggering bloodbath, uh, which was a gleaming light in Asia uh, because the independent, uh, uh, the, part, the main party of the poor was totally wiped out and the country was opened up to Western exploitation. Uh, so that was the model. Uh, and it's true that the United States did not succeed in imposing that model on uh, Indochina. Uh, so in that respect, it was a failure, and the U.S. lost the war, couldn't create an Indonesia. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the major war aims, uh, that wasn't what it was at all. Uh, and uh, uh, this is incidentally a case where Vietnam is quite different from Iraq. In Vietnam, the U.S. had no particular interest in maintaining control over Vietnam, quite unlike Iraq. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the goal in Vietnam, the, the basic war aim in Vietnam was to destroy the country and for good rational reasons, uh, which they explained in places like Harvard and MIT. Uh, the problem was that uh, an, they were concerned that uh, uh, an independent Vietnam might undertake a course of development that would become a kind of a model that others in the region would want to follow. It's what's called in internal documents a virus uh, that might infect others. And when you have a virus that might infect others, you have to destroy the virus and inoculate the others. And that what was done, the virus was destroyed, never going to be a model to anybody, and the uh, potential victims were inoculated, uh, like in Indonesia with the uh, uh, staggering mass slaughter that was a gleaming light in Asia and the same in surrounding countries, Marcos and the Philippines and so on. And the concern about the spread of the infection was very deep. Uh, so George Kennan, for example, was afraid that, uh, was when he was one of the top planners, that infection in Indonesia might spread throughout uh, uh, all of South Asia, even threatening uh, the U.S. position in the Middle East, a crucial area where the world's energy is. And it was feared that the Vietnamese virus might extend as far as Indonesia. Uh, and if that happened, uh, Japan, it was uh, John Dower here described Japan as the super domino. Japan might have to accommodate to the Asian mainland, becoming its industrial and technological center uh, in an independent area. And that would, uh, in effect, create, uh, recreate uh, what Japan was trying to achieve during World War II, uh, they called the co-prosperity sphere, which would mean that the United States would have lost the Second World War. Uh, and the United States government was not prepared in uh, the, the late 1940s to lose the Second World War. And Vietnam, as John F. Kennedy put it, was the keystone in the arch. I mean, if that one fell, as it was called, that is, moved towards independence, the rot would spread, the virus would infect others, and you could have, you know, it could turn out to be terrible. Uh, Kennan incidentally had no objection to restoring to Japan uh, what he called its empire toward the south, that is, its co-prosperity sphere, and the United States, in fact, did that, but this time it was under U.S. control, so it was okay. Uh, that's why Kennan supported reconstructing the Japanese uh, world order, but of course under U.S. control. And Vietnam was regarded as the keystone of the arch for that. Well, you know, by, by 1968, it was pretty clear to anyone with eyes open uh, that Vietnam would be lucky to survive. Uh, it uh, uh, wasn't going to be a model for anyone. The virus was destroyed. The region had been inoculated. 
Uh, so the war became, as uh, McGeorge Bundy later said, former Harvard dean who was national security advisor for Kennedy, he said after 1965, uh, with the mass slaughter, staggering mass slaughter in Indonesia, he said the U.S. war in Indochina became excessive. Uh, in other words, costing us too much. So it was kind of like a bad tactical decision to keep going after the basic war aims had been won. Uh, that's... Uh, um, but that's the core of the issue, I think, and that's why business turned against the war had by 1968 and a year or two later at the extreme dissident left of intellectual opinion, you were allowed to call the war uh, a mistake uh, that began with blundering efforts to do good. Uh, well, the idea of, that's in the heads of the population that it was fundamentally wrong and immoral and not a mistake uh, that has to be driven from their minds, uh, clearly. And there have been huge efforts to do that uh, ever since with kind of mixed uh, effects. The polls remain more or less the same. Uh, on the other hand, there has been an effect. So, for example, knowledge of the war is, extra is extraordinary in the United States. Uh, there was actually one, there's only been one major academic study, as far as I know, of uh, what people believe about the war, and it's mind-boggling. Uh, a couple of years ago, they found that people were asked to give an estimate of the number of Vietnamese who, were, who, who died during the war. And the mean estimate uh, was 100,000, which is about 5% of the official U.S. figure and probably 2 or 3% of the actual figure. Uh, the authors of the study point out that it's as if you took a uh, took a poll in uh, Germany and asked people uh, how many Jews died in Holocaust, and the mean judgment was 300,000, uh, in which case we'd think that there's a slight problem in Germany. Uh, but uh, here, it's kept from us. We're not supposed to think about it. Uh, the, uh, the results are even worse because it turns out that this poll was, in a, was taken in a leading Northeastern university, uh, which is pretty uh, politically active for the general population, might be even crazier. Uh, right before the uh, November election last year, I happened to be away and, you know, trying to find out what was going on in the world and in a hotel, so I turned on television, uh, something I usually try to avoid. But I got an interesting program. There was a program, I think it was on CNN or something, uh, a, uh, an hour-long serious discussion led by the uh, chief media critic of the Washington Post, Howard Kurtz, with lots of deep thinkers. Uh, and the program was called America's Vietnam Obsession. Uh, and it was about the strange obsession of the United States with Vietnam after all these years. What they were talking about is, you know, did Kerry uh, deserve the bronze medal and all that kind of stuff. Well, what the program demonstrated is that America's Vietnam obsession, at least among liberal elite opinion, is zero. Uh, there's only one question that arises about Kerry in uh, Vietnam, and that is, what was he doing in 1969 uh, deep in the Mekong Delta, seven which had been practically devastated, killing South Vietnamese, seven years after John F. Kennedy had launched an outright war against South Vietnam, just focused on places like the Viet, uh, Mekong Delta, and 15 years after the United States had instituted a Latin American-style terror state in South Vietnam, uh, which, as Long just mentioned, had killed 70,000 people in the Mekong Delta alone. Uh, well, whatever happened in the whole country. So what was uh, Kerry doing there 15 years after this? Uh, right in the midst of 1969, which incidentally happened to be the peak period of U.S. atrocities in South, in South Vietnam. That was the post-Tet accelerated pacification campaign, which was carrying out extraordinary atrocities, of which one became famous, My Lai, which, was a, which became famous because you could blame it on poor, uneducated half-crazed GIs in the field who didn't know who was shooting at them next and did commit an atrocity. But as it happened, uh, that was a minor footnote to a major mass murder campaign uh, 
Operation Wheeler Wallawa, which was organized by nice guys like us and sitting in air-conditioned offices who were plotting B-52 raids on villages and you know, killing who knows how many tens of thousands of people. Uh, so therefore, they're immune because they're our kind. But uh, Milai was those guys. So it's allowed, you're allowed to be angry about it. In fact, there was a Quaker clinic in Kwangnai province uh, working right where Milai was. They knew about the atrocity immediately, but they didn't even bother reporting it because it was happening every day. You know, okay, what's the big deal? Here's just another one. Uh, those are the real stories, but not the ones we know. Anyway, that's the question. Those are the que kind of questions that would arise uh, if there was even concern, let alone obsession, about what actually happened in Vietnam among uh, liberal intellectual elites, but there isn't. Uh, the uh, 1962, when Kennedy escalated from a Latin American-style terror state, which had killed who knows how many tens of thousands of people, escalated to an outright war. Uh, 1962 uh, was the year when the, when the U.S. Air Force, when Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam, uh, authorized the use of napalm, uh, initiated the use of chemical warfare uh, to destroy food crops so as to drive the population into the uh, concentration camps, which had been given various names, uh, ultimately many millions of them. Uh, uh, to the uh, story was that they had to be protected uh, behind uh, barbed wire from the South Vietnamese resistance, which they were willingly supporting. Uh, and it was, there was no controversy over the fact that they were willingly supporting them. That was understood. It was recognized on all sides. You look at the internal documents and so on, they agreed that it was a political war against a military war. Uh, the, South, the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese had political strength and the U.S. had military strength. Uh, so therefore, the U.S. naturally shifted the war to the arena in which they could in which they prevail, could prevail, uh, military strength, which is why the atrocities took place. Uh, the South Vietnamese, uh, who uh, were the victims of the war, were labeled aggressors, uh, or as some put it, Adlai Stevenson, a uh, liberal hero, Kennedy's ambassador to the UN, they called it internal aggression. Interesting new concept. Uh, it was an assault from within, according to John F. Kennedy. Uh, and the terminology was, made some sense. The technical definition of aggression in U.S. Army manuals included as one type of aggression uh, political warfare. That's one type of aggression. So, yes, they were indeed the aggressors in their own country, and we were defending ourselves by uh, slaughtering them. Uh, the, uh, and the U.S. was entirely aware of this. Uh, so Kennedy's ambassador in South Vietnam, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, was cabling back that the generals are all we've got. We've lost everybody else. But there's a problem with the generals. He said uh, they have not been able to construct an efficient police state like Hitler's Germany. Uh, so therefore, we've got some problems. We've got to get over this and let them do it. Well, we turn to the reshaping of history uh, after the war, uh, when you have to start reconstructing it the right way in people's minds. Uh, we get to say President Carter, uh, 1977, uh, whose view, who gave his view of the war, this again is at the kind of liberal extreme. Uh, he said, uh, we owe Vietnam no debt because the destruction was mutual. Uh, you want to see how mutual it was, take a walk in Plains, Georgia, and, you know, the Mekong Delta, and you'll see. What was interesting about that comment is that it received no, re no reaction. Uh, nobody was appalled. Yeah, okay. Uh, destruction was mutual, so we don't owe them any debt. Uh, by the time you get to Bush number one, there's a much harder line. There is a debt. It's theirs. Uh, they're the ones who are guilty. Uh, the uh, destruction was not mutual. It took place in here in Texas. Uh, but he said, we're nice guys, uh, so uh, in his words, we seek only answers without the threat of retribution for the past. In other words, we're willing to forget all the crimes that you committed against us, and we only seek answers because we're such nice guys. Now, what are the answers? Well, the answers are to the one moral issue that remains after destroying South Vietnam. Uh, 
uh, namely the missing in action, uh, who were somehow shot down over Iowa, you know, by some strange way. Uh, but as long as that gets answers, everything's fine. We don't need any answers about the millions of corpses in South Vietnam uh, or about the uh, hundreds of thousands of victims of chemical warfare, uh, which we have recently learned, though it doesn't get reported, uh, was at about twice the intensity of what was reported during the war, and according to U.S. analysts, left about 2, 2 million, 2.1 million victims. Uh, we don't have to t need answers for the this deformed fetuses in Saigon hospitals, and the people who are still dying, including people who uh, 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 born after, years after the chemical warfare officially stopped, but are still uh, contracting uh, serious diseases, cancer and uh, uh, mutilation and so on. But we don't have to ask about that. And in fact, it almost never gets reported. Actually, sometimes it does, to be fair. There was an article in the science section of the New York Times a couple of years ago that uh, uh, suggested that it's really not a good idea to ignore this. We should study it. Uh, the reason we should study it is that it's, a good, it's an unusually good uh, experimental situation because we have a control group. Uh, it's only South Vietnam that was subjected to this particular war crime, uh, not North Vietnam, but to have the same genes. So we can study the effects of incredibly high uh, uh, concentrations of dioxin, one of the most the worst carcinogens known. Uh, we can study the effects of this uh, on humans by comparing the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese. Uh, and maybe we could learn something from that with, that would be useful for us. Uh, so really, it might be a good idea to look for answers. Uh, the, uh, we'll go on a couple of years, and we get to uh, Robert McNamara's uh, memoirs 10 years ago, in retrospect. The reaction to the, uh, to the book was, ex I won't talk about the book, but the reaction to it was extremely interesting. Uh, the Hawks uh, condemned McNamara for treachery. Uh, the Doves applauded him because they were vindicated. And this includes, you know, the real people way out at the edge. I mean, the religious leaders who were opposing the war on uh, moral grounds. They were vindicated. Why? Uh, because McNamara issued an apology, which is true. He issued an apology to Americans, not to Vietnamese. Not a word about that. He issued an apology to Americans for not telling them early enough that the war was probably going to be too costly to Americans. So the doves are vindicated. Well, you know, tells you something. Uh, the, uh, in McMara's retrospect, uh, he does, it's mostly U.S. government sources, but he quotes one outside expert. Uh, it's a good choice. It's Bernard Fall, who incidentally was an extreme hawk. Uh, but an unusual, and, and a military historian and a Vietnamese specialist and knew a lot about the country and, in fact, was killed there. Uh, so it was a good choice. Uh, and um, uh, he was unusual among Vietnamese specialists in that he actually cared about the people, even though he was a super hawk. Uh, McNamara quotes him. Uh, he says that in, 19, in 1965 is when the official war started. You know, the U.S. started bombing North Vietnam and sent troops to the south. Uh, in 1965, McNamara says that uh, he quote, he, cite, he doesn't quote, he refers to Bernard Fall, a great expert, and he said Fall was providing encouraging news, uh, McNamara says, encouraging news uh, which helped persuade Washington uh, that the U.S. effort could not fail. So that was really good news. W what did Fall actually say? Uh, what he said is, in 1965, uh, he said what changed the character of the war was not the bombing of North Vietnam, not the sending of U.S. soldiers to the south, but the decision to escalate the, uh, to unlimited aerial warfare against South Vietnam at the price of literally pounding the place to, to bits. That was the encouraging news because he added, well, in the short run, the U.S. probably can't lose. Uh, so Washington was very encouraged. The Washington liberals were very encouraged uh, because it falls that they could not lose at the price of pounding the place to bits. Uh, McNamara goes on and says that in 1967, Fall reversed his stand uh, 
and felt that U.S. power and technology might not prevail. Again, he doesn't quote him, but here's what he said. He said, Vietnam as a cultural and historic entity is threatened with extinction under the blows of the largest military machine ever unleashed against an area this size, and U.S. force might prevail, he, he felt, extinguishing the country. Uh, so that's, if you can try to figure out what goes on in someone's head who reports that sort of thing, I, let me know about it. Uh, the uh, operative values of the U.S. war are very well illustrated by comparison of the bombing of the South and the bombing of the North. The bombing of the South was vastly more intense uh, and started years earlier. Uh, but if you look at the records, we now have a rich array of records from the Pentagon Papers and other internal sources and memoirs like McNamara's, and they're all the same. Uh, the bombing of the North was meticulously planned you know, very careful thinking about should we go here, should we escalate a little, and so on and so forth, huge record. Uh, the bombing of the South is barely mentioned. There weren't any plans. Uh, you just do it, you know. Right? Bomb the place to bits, extinguish the country. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's also true of the anti-war movement, uh, unfortunately. Most of the protest was against the bombing of the North. Uh, which was a crime, a hideous crime, but peripheral. I mean, the bombing of the South, the attack on the South, the counterinsurgency and the bombing and everything else, were far worse uh, among the sort of, in the establishment, a protest was almost entirely against the bombing of the North. The bombing of the South was barely mentioned. Well, what's the difference between them? Unfortunately, it's uh, regrettably easy to answer, to give this explanation, to give the explanation. The bombing of the South was costless to, to the United States. The population was totally defenseless. So you could bomb them as much as you want. Uh, do you want to drive the country to extinction? Not going to cost you anything. And there was not very much international protest because the West accepts the moral principles of Western imperialism. After all, it's been going on for hundreds of years. If you want to destroy defenseless people, that's your right. On the other hand, the bombing of the North was dangerous for the United States. You're bombing the north, so you might be hitting uh, Russian ships in the Haiphong Harbor or uh, a China, an internal Chinese railroad, which happens to pass through North Vietnam. And there are embassies in Hanoi, which might not be happy about it, Western embassies, and so on. So bombing of the north carried a certain risk for the United States and therefore was meticulously planned. But bombing of the south being completely costless uh, is scarcely even mentioned. Well, unfortunately, that's uh, easy to talk about and to explain. And the same is true of, uh, you know, the few, the very rare cases like My Lai, where atrocities are acknowledged, as long as you can blame them on somebody else, not like us. You'll notice that uh, the same is going on in Iraq. Uh, what happened at Abu Ghraib, for example, is uh, criminal, but it's, so, it's much easier to blame it on, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever her name is, England, some uneducated uh, person from who's sort of forced into the army but because it's a mercenary army, the poor, and to absolve, uh, say, Donald Rumsfeld or George Tenet or George Bush, who are the people who are responsible. Actually, Human Rights Watch just put out a report on that, which won't be reported, I'm sure. The uh, same in, say, Fallujah. Uh, there, was, there were reports about atrocities in Fallujah. One Marine killed somebody who was apparently wounded or not resisting. That became a big atrocity. Uh, what about the, uh, the turning Fallujah into Grozny, you know, just smashing the city to dust? Well, that's not an atrocity. Uh, what about capturing the general hospital uh, the first day uh, and forcing the patients to lie on the floor, taking them out of bed, forcing them to lie on the floor, uh, hands manacled behind their back under guard, that wasn't a secret. There's a big front page picture in the New York Times about it. I mean, that is a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, and uh, George Bush, in fact, is subject to the death penalty for that under U.S. law, under the U.S. War Crimes Act. <laughs> That's literally true. The U.S. War Crimes Act of 1996, passed by a Republican Congress, uh, makes grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions uh, uh, 
crime punishable by death. Actually, that's part of the reason, I presume, why Bush's legal counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, now attorney general, advised him to rescind the Geneva Conventions uh, because he said it would reduce the possibility, the likelihood of punishment. Uh, well, not bad advice. Okay, I'm barely uh, skimming the surface, uh, and I'll stop here. Uh, but uh, the general point is that um, we're not talking about some you know, exotic uh, tribe we don't understand. Uh, we're talking about ourselves, you know, the most important topic, the one we're supposed to understand best, and the one that's certainly most important to us. And unless uh, people like us become capable of uh, looking in the mirror honestly, uh, the biology's uh, only experiment with uh, higher intelligence is likely to prove uh, quite brief. If you'd like to ask a question, just line up in front of one of the two microphones over there. And uh, our speakers are going to sit here, so we'll need their mics to be on. And again, please keep your questions to one minute and uh, pose them in the form of a question. Uh, Professor Chomsky. Would you be willing to take a position, Professor Chomsky, on the on a parallel between the development of fascism through the disenfranchisement of the middle class in Germany between 1890 and 1930, and a similar disenfranchisement which seems to be going on in the middle class of the United States and the development of the seeds of fascism within the United States of America today. I really don't think it's a useful comparison. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's worth remembering that Germany, prior to World War I, World War I set off a wave of manufactured uh, anti-German hysteria in the United States, uh, like the Boston Symphony couldn't play Beethoven, and things like that. Uh, but prior to World War I, before the mass hysteria organized by the Wilson administration, uh, Germany was regarded as the model democracy. Uh, you look at American political science literature, uh, and they regarded Germany literally as the model to follow for democracy. You know, efficient bureaucracy, uh, voting, big social democratic party, huge, uh, way beyond anything in any other country, strong left movement. Uh, it was the model democracy. The Weimar Republic in between the wars up till 33 was again a you know, horrible conditions, but a pretty well functioning democracy. Uh, Hitler came along, of course that changed, but Hitler didn't disenfranchise the middle class. In fact, Hitler was probably the most popular leader in uh, German history uh, up until things started to go wrong, uh, partly because he was carrying out what was called a social revolution that was improving the economy, you know, giving people things and so on. Uh, there are comparisons to be made, but I, I really don't think that's the one. In the United States also, I don't really think it's correct to talk about the middle class being disenfranchised. The entire population is being disenfranchised outside of a very narrow elite. I uh, could go on with this, but the last elections were pretty striking. I mean, almost, almost no voters had any idea what the stand of the candidates was on issues. Uh, not because they're stupid, uh, but because the elections are designed so as to prevent people from knowing. Elections, after all, are run here now by the same guys who sell you toothpaste and uh, lifestyle drugs on television. Uh, you look at an ad on television, you don't expect to be informed. You expect to be deluded. That's the point of those hundreds of billions of dollars. And when they sell candidates, it's the same thing. They're projecting imagery that's supposed to delude people. But the last thing they want people to pay attention to is the issues. And the reason for that, which doesn't get reported, uh, is that um, 
there's extensive evidence showing that the bipartisan consensus and the media are far to the right of the general population on a whole host of major issues. So it's quite important to get issues off the agenda and to project imagery like in toothpaste ads. And that's a kind of disenfranchisement, but it's a different kind than what was carried out in Germany. Uh, Professor, Professor Chomsky uh, and Professor Long, maybe you can comment as well. Um, in the recent Iraqi elections, as you know, uh, the American puppet leader, Alawi, uh, the American appointed leader, uh, only received about 15 percent of the vote, and all the other candidates that were associated with the American occupation, as you know, basically were voted out of office. Uh, and they now have a Shiite majority that is leaning more and more toward Iran. My question is this. Um, if this trend continues as, as the Americans perceive them to move closer to Iran, in essence, uh, because of a commonality of Shiite uh, religion and so forth, do you feel that the United States government may take some type of covert or back-of-the-scenes type of maneuvers and so forth to undermine and destroy this government and claim that it's illegitimate uh, because basically, let's face it, it's not going to carry out the American agenda in Iraq, which Americans consider vitally important to their energy needs for the future. Well, uh, it's already happening, so we don't have to speculate. But the, uh, it's, despite the, if you look back a little bit, it's not ancient history, uh, the U.S. tried in every imaginable way to prevent the election. It was strongly opposed to the election. It, it proposed all sorts of devices and trickery to avoid elections. Uh, but it was forced, it was compelled pretty recently, uh, it was compelled to uh, allow elections. That should be regarded, I think, as a major victory of nonviolent resistance. I mean, it's not, the U.S. doesn't care that much about suicide bombers, like in Vietnam. In the arena of violence, the U.S. is going to prevail, just such overwhelming power. So you want to have suicide bombers, okay. Uh, but the mass nonviolent resistance, for which Sistani was kind of a symbol, uh, that was so strong, you know, huge demonstrations, this and that, that the U.S. had to agree to elections. And as soon as it, uh, of course, once it agreed to them, it took credit for them. That's naturally, and the media talk about it too, and so on. But the facts are un, just uncontroversial. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the more intelligent and independent analysts point them out. Uh, once the U.S. could not avoid the elections, it immediately sort of went to the next level. Let's try and subvert them. So it did uh, have its own candidate, the Adelawi, uh, and he was given every possible advantage, you know, access to the unique access to state television. I mean, every resource the state could provide. Uh, the independent media were kicked out of the country. Uh, Al Jazeera, which is the most important of the independent media, was tossed out of the country so that they wouldn't interfere with a free election by reporting what's going on. Uh, but nevertheless, as you say, um, although a U.S. candidate got actually about 14 percent of the vote uh, and technically is not in the cabinet, although some of his sidekicks are, uh, the uh, um, every single uh, aside from the Kurds who have their own interests of the Arab uh, parties, uh, every one of them that was of any significance, including even the U.S. candidate, including Alawi, uh, had as a leading plank uh, a U.S. withdrawal. But the U.S. got to work on that very fast, and those are out. So by now they've all backed off on that and are now talking about, you know, some kind of vague promises. Okay, that's a victory. Uh, the next question is who's going to take over the oil ministry? Uh, right now, it's in the hands of Ahmed Chalabi. I don't have to talk to you about that. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, as for uh, if the, I mean, it is almost inconceivable that the U.S. could permit a sovereign democratic Iraq. It's virtual. It's not like Vietnam. Once Vietnam was sort of destroyed, the U.S. was happy to forget about it. But Iraq, you can't forget about it. I mean, it's right at the heart of the world's energy-producing region. It's the last major uh, unexploited energy resource in the world. You know, huge untapped energy resources, very cheap. No permafrost, no tar sands, just stick a pipe in the ground and the oil gushes out. Uh, the U.S. is certainly going to try to insist on controlling that. 
furthermore, if the, you just imagine what the policies of an independent sovereign Iraq would be, I mean, they don't love Iran particularly, but they'd much rather be friendly to Iran than be hostile to them. So they'll improve relations with Iran. Uh, they will uh, stimulate, it's already happening, they'll stimulate moves towards autonomy and independence in the Shiite areas of Saudi Arabia nearby, which happens to be where all the oil is. Uh, so you can see not far in the future a Shiite bloc, independent, controlling the world's major energy resources. I mean, the chances of the U.S. permitting this are like an asteroid hitting the Earth tomorrow. It's not going to happen. Uh, furthermore, an independent sovereign Iraq will try to regain its position as the leading Arab state, which is its natural position. It goes back to biblical times. That means rearming, confronting the regional enemy, namely Israel, probably developing weapons of mass destruction as a deterrent. The U.S. going to sit by and watch that happen? No. I mean, the idea is so outlandish that the fact that people are talking about the U.S. You know, trying to give sovereignty to Iraq is, you can't even call it a bad joke. I mean, it's inconceivable, you know. So, of course, that's not going to happen. The only question is how you manipulate it so it doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's lots of means. I mean, you've got 150,000 troops in the country. Uh, the U.S. Has, maintains control of the, uh, any of the economic support. A lot of it has been withheld as a lever to control the new government. Uh, so it's uh, very hard to know what to do. I mean, if, say, the Ayatollah Sistani calls for mass demonstrations to uh, insist on, say, a timetable for U.S. withdrawal, it's very hard to predict what the consequences will be. Professor Long, do you want to comment yeah, on yeah, that? Yeah. I'm not going to comment on Iraq with, because Professor uh, Chomsky has uh, basically stated all the things. But I want to say a little bit about elections in Vietnam and the lessons from that. Every election in Vietnam was weak in the most blatant manner in favor of the Saigon regime. Uh, not only the first election uh, for Jim, but for example, the 1967 election, in which Vice President Key himself stated that, that the cheating was mind boggling uh, in a country in the southern part of Vietnam which had uh, uh, 8,100 polling stations, 7,000 committed 11 violations, which meant that there were all the violations that was in the book on the day that uh, the National Assembly in Vietnam was supposed to vote to ratify uh, the election. General Nguyen Ngoc Luan was the head of the police charged into uh, um, the National Assembly, which is your, like your Congress here, got into the balcony, pulled out his pistol, sat back, put his legs on uh, the table and drank beer. Uh, uh, and then you know, General Le Nguyen Khang, you know, brought the army, uh, the, the two divisions into Saigon. Uh, and so six hours later, the Saigon uh, um, Congress or Parliament uh, ratified uh, the election in Vietnam. Uh, and then I can talk on about elections in Vietnam. Everyone was, you know, horribly rigged. But the point here is this. The point of the election is not for Vietnamese consumption. It's for American consumption. To, to, to show that there is now democracy in Vietnam and the new democratic regime is asking the United States to stay in Vietnam and, you know, escalate its effort. You know. And then when the United States fails, just organize another rigged election. Uh, and, but once you have legitimized a corrupt uh, uh, Saigon regime, for example, or a regime in Iraq, then you have to stick with it. Uh, United States stuck with uh, Golden Jim for nine years until, you know, uh, he could not be propped up, so he, you know, he had to be, you know, gotten rid of. And then the United States stuck up with uh, Till for nine more years. The United States never had any exit strategy from Vietnam. And the United States is not going to have any exit strategy from Iraq either because Iraq, as Professor Chomsky pointed out, is much more important than Vietnam. Vietnam was to provide a lesson for people elsewhere, especially other countries in Southeast Asia, not to get into their heads that revolutions pay. Uh, 
you know, and that, you know, and that even if you succeed in getting rid of American clientele regimes in Vietnam, the United States is going to, going to, was going to make the country of Vietnam pay in such a heavy, uh, uh, such, uh, uh, make Vietnam pay in such uh, uh, a heavy manner that Vietnam would not be able to recover for years to come. And that's so true. 30 years after the war ended, Vietnam is still struggling with rebuilding the country. And this has taught people elsewhere in Southeast Asia a lesson, in, in a way, not to fight against the United States. And that was a point like Vietnam. Uh, uh, but Iraq would have similar problems. And when the United States fails in Iraq, in some reason, of course, the enemies are going to be in Iran. The enemies are going to be in Syria. So let's extend the war. Uh, expand the war. And the United States did that in, 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 in Vietnam. The United States expanded the war into Cambodia and Laos and, and North Vietnam, you know, to say that, you know, uh, the reason for our failure didn't have anything to do with our effort to build democracy in South Vietnam. It had to do with all these evil countries and people around that. Uh, and so I see not only no ex exit uh, strategy, but I, think I see the possible expansion of the war to other countries like Iraq and Syria. The woman over here is next. Hi, thank you. Most of the people in this audience, as I look around, weren't born um, 30 years ago when Vietnamese threw out the U.S. military. Um, I'm one of those statistics that Dr. Chomsky mentioned in 1969 as a teenager. Um, I realized immorality and destruction in Vietnam, and it turned me and my family from right wing Republicans to demonstrators in the street. Um, I also had the privilege of listening to L. Paul Bremer at my alma mater, Clark University, a couple of weeks ago, in which um, 750 Clark University students, I would say probably 98%, were not happy that he was there at the tune of $40,000, which he was paid for about an hour and a half worth of discussion. Um, and most of them walked out chanting, refund, refund. <laughs> um, I have two part question. One, what websites, what newsletters, what ways that people can be informed? Um, and I know this is the tough one, is how come we don't see 100,000 US citizens in the street, 500,000 US citizens in the street in Boston, demonstrating, saying, out now, in Iraq. Well, see, I think people are comparing Iraq and Ir Vietnam at the wrong stages. How many people did you see demonstrating in the streets in Boston in 1962 when the U.S. Uh, escalated from, a ma from mass murder in a terror state to outright invasion? Well, I can tell you the answer to that, zero. I mean, at those days, I was giving talks in... Uh, churches where, you know, there might be four people. I mean, the minister, the organizer, a uh, drunk who walked in off the street and somebody wanted to kill you. And, and uh, that went on for years. I mean, the first public, major public demonstration in Boston was in October 1965 at the Boston Common. I was supposed to be one of the speakers. Nobody could speak because the place was attacked by thousands of counter-demonstrators, most of them students coming from, uh, you know, organized universities. In fact, the only reason we weren't killed was because there were a lot of state police around. You may not have liked what we were saying, but didn't want to see somebody killed on the Boston Common. That was October 1965. That was after, long after the time when the U.S. had escalated the war against South Vietnam at the price of pounding the, piece, the place to bits, okay? Uh, it was years after the U.S. war. In fact, by the time demonstrations began, seriously, like 67, that's when Bernard Fall was worrying that Vietnam as a historical and cultural entity might become extinct under the uh, uh, attack of the worst and greatest military machine in, that had ever been launched. I was very limited protest against the Vietnam War. And when protests finally did develop, by 67, 68, 69, it was mostly focused on the bombing of the North. I mean, the bombing, of the, the destruction of the South is almost unknown. I mean, uh, 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 and let's compare that with Iraq. 
I mean, Iraq is the first time in the history of the West, Europe and the United States, when there was mass opposition to a war before it was even launched, not eight years later. Now, what's going on in Iraq is awful in all sorts of ways, but it is not the kind of thing that that's going to elicit demonstrations. Um, it's kind of like South Vietnam in 1957 or something like that. Uh, it's, uh, and it's complex. I mean, there, there is a crucial difference. What Long said about the Vietnamese elections is absolutely correct, but the Iraqi elections were different. Paul Bremer tried to stop them. He's the one who was in charge of trying to avoid elections, and they were compelled to accept them by mass popular opposition. Actually, what took place was not really an election. It was more like a census. So the Kurds voted for the Kurdish candidate, and the Shiites overwhelmingly voted for the candidate that the Ayatollah Sistani told them to vote for, a Shiite candidate, and the Sunnis mostly didn't vote. So it was kind of a census. But nevertheless, it was forced on the occupying forces. And now the question is, can they force on the occupying forces their own agenda? Uh, and it, it, this is, you know, and in this kind of situation, we should be doing something. But what we should be doing, in my opinion, is f compelling the U.S. government to accept the will of the uh, uh, Iraqis, as indeed expressed in their own electoral uh, candidates, and to prevent the U.S. from doing what Bremer was trying to do. I'm sure he didn't talk about this at. at, at uh, Clark, but the main thing that he did was to impose a legal, a, a totally illegal, completely illegal, in fact criminal, set of uh, regulations, again in violation of the Geneva Conventions, uh, which opened up uh, the Iraqi economy to almost total takeover by U.S. corporations. And right now the U.S. is trying to compel the new government to accept those. And there's a lot of opposition to it in Iraq, and we ought to be taking a stand on that. Uh, also, uh, we should be taking a stand on trying to get the, um, the opinion of the vast majority of, Ameri of the American population uh, into the public arena on this. For two years now, around 70% of the public has been calling for uh, U.S. forces in Iraq, if they're there, to be under U.N. supervision, not U.S., not U.S. command. In fact, the large majority of the American public is in favor of what Spanish voters voted for last year. I remember Spain last year, uh, it was kind of not reported accurately, what they actually voted for, the Spanish voters, was not to withdraw troops, but to keep troops there only under UN authorization and command, which happened to be the position of about 70% of Americans. Uh, and they voted out the government because it wouldn't do that. Well, there's a difference between Spain and the United States in this respect, and one that we should, which should concern us. Uh, Spain's no model democracy, far from it. But in Spain, people were aware of public opinion. Here they're not. And in Spain, people could vote on their opinions. Here it's inconceivable. Neither political party would ever dream of mentioning that, and the media wouldn't mention it. Those are serious problems here. Uh, and those problems have to be overcome. But I think the position of the large majority of the American population is not unreasonable. Uh, they are correct, I think, in thinking that an international organization, the UN is the only one around, and that would mean the General Assembly, which has authority and the U.S. doesn't have a veto, uh, and has some reflection of third world voices, uh, that should be in charge of uh, reconstruction, political transition, and security uh, in Iraq until Iraqis tell them we'll take it over. That's a sensible position, but for that, you know, mass popular demonstrations are not really the right technique. I'd like to endorse uh, Professor um, Chomsky's statement on the peace movement here in this country. Um, it was 20 years after the, uh, the U.S. involvement in Vietnam that, you know, only a small number of Americans knew anything about Vietnam.
And when we started organizing here in this country, uh, with very small groups of people, I, for example, every week I went out to talk almost six or seven times a week to groups of two or three persons or whatever, and we started building this kind of thing up. The, uh, but we should not pat ourselves on the back for that because basically what happened by 67, 68 was there were a tremendous number of American soldiers died in Vietnam. Every week about 400 persons, in, uh, you know, and in casual days. And I would like to hate, I hate to say this, but, you know, uh, I, and you know, until uh, we wouldn't have these mass demonstrations that you mentioned, about, uh, you know, uh, in Vietnam, until we have more Americans coming back, you know, in body bags. Uh, but, but I don't wish that on American people. Uh, but what I, what I want to, and another thing I want to endorse Professor Chomsky is that the American people have learned something about the Vietnam War. And the American people have reacted to other situations after the Vietnam War much, much more quickly than it ever reacted to Vietnam. Uh, and in this case, you see, uh, there was a preemptive reaction to the American invasion of Iraq. And, and I think the American people have learned to distrust the government or to question you know, their, their lies. And I think that's a benefit that the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement in, here in this country eh, have contributed to, the, to, to, to this country. I, I should just add to that uh, a separate point. It just happens that I just came back from the West, in fact, from what are reputed to be the most conservative regions of the West. Uh, like right on the Idaho border, where you see nothing but uh, right-wing Christian evangelicals and, you know, the National Rifle Association and so on. I mean, th there were audiences of 4,000 people, you know, turning others away. Uh, it's not – the Northeast is one of the most backward areas in this respect. It's not a joke. You find this all over the country. People are engaged, uh, concerned, you know, and want to get involved in something. And there's very little in the way of organization to, there's nothing, you know, nobody's telling, there's nobody putting together something they could do. That's quite different from Vietnam. And it's some, it means there are real opportunities. You know. um, first of all, I have a hello for No Vin Long from a former colleague of yours at the Indochina Resource Center named Gareth Porter. Yes, thank who you. Was, here a couple of days ago talking about a new book that he's uh, published about the history of the war in Vietnam called The Perils of Dominance. Mm. And there are a couple things interesting from this book that I want to mention and ask for your comments on. Um, one is that he argues based on documents and examining the record that nobody in the national security foreign policy establishment in the United States really believed in the so-called domino theory that through the period um, of the 1950s and early 60s, um, they were very confident of their military superiority vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and China, including nuclear superiority, and felt they had flexibility to do whatever they wanted in Vietnam. I'm paraphrasing, but that therefore this is, for example, why they abrogated the Geneva Accords, why they felt they could just uh, ignore the uh, Accords, the plan to have elections in 56, and then uh, things that happened later. Um, the other, in, one other interesting comment that he made uh, uh, was that he believed that Kennedy resisted, although he was uh, authorizing counterinsurgency warfare, that Kennedy was not inclined to a more massive covert military intervention, that he uh, authorized. Uh, uh, back-channel communications through Averill Harriman to the Vietnamese, which in fact Averill Harriman refused to to uh, carry out, and that there was resistance from the national security establishment in the military to Kennedy's stance, and they were pushing for uh, a stronger military intervention, and that this same tension in fact existed to some degree in the first months after Johnson came into the White House. Um, interested in your comments on these, these theses. And, and finally, um, if, if either of you would care to elaborate on what No was speaking about in terms of how the victory that I hope we're celebrating today has uh, played out over the intervening years in Vietnam. <laughs> 
Uh, let me comment on the first thing. The, uh, the second question, I don't know the details of, of uh, uh, these exchanges. But to me, that's not very, that's not very, that's not relevant. Uh, because you see whether, you know, uh, uh, Kennedy's people withheld information from him or did not carry out uh, certain orders, you know, that's, you know, uh, in a way, I mean, it may justify Kennedy, but we, we, we would never know what. Uh, as far as the first thing was concerned, yes, it's true that the domino theory thing was meant for the American public, uh, to scare the American public. Uh, and not the domino in the real sense of the, uh, uh, they never thought about domino in the real sense of the world, that if Vietnam failed, other c c uh, countries would form right after that, and that, you know, the Viet Cong would land in, in Honolulu or, or, or San Francisco or anything. But they were, they were thinking of domino in this term, that if the Vietnamese struggle for, for freedom and independence and justice, you see, were, uh, were uh, to be easier you know, and that you don't do make them pay a very high price for that, that it may get into the heads of people elsewhere in Southeast Asia that revolutions pay. And that, you say you can make social changes and you can demand justice, not only, you know, for your own, I mean, for your own people, but also for the region. Uh, in, a, in effect, you know, an effort of decolonization and confronting American imperialism in that area, and I don't think the United States would ever allow that. So... I'd just like to add to that that, you know, it's been known for 40 years that there are two versions of the domino theory. There's a public version, which is, you know, Ho Chi Minh's going to get into a canoe and come to San Francisco and rape your grandmother. That's the public version. Uh, and that, of course, was everybody always regarded as ridiculous in internally. That's for the public. On the other hand, there's an internal version of the domino theory, which has never been questioned and is still not questioned, and, and the reason is because it's true. The internal, ver the, uh, uh, the other version is what Long just pointed out. Uh, and this just runs right through the whole post-war history, and it has uh, sources way back th through the history of uh, Western imperialism. Uh, if there is successful independent development somewhere, it might appeal to people nearby who are suffering from the same problems. And therefore, you've got to kill the virus at its source and inoculate the region from infection. That version of the domino theory is correct, and that's why it has never been questioned internally. Never. Nothing in the internal record questioning it. And in fact, it continues to go on over and over. Isn't it? Not particularly Vietnam. I mean, say, take Cuba. I mean, Kennedy was a, Kennedy in general, I'll come to the second question in, in a minute, but he was a super hawk. Uh, not only in Vietnam, where he was one of the most hawkish members of the administration, uh, but also in Cuba. Cuba. And we know the reasons, because we have a rich internal documentary record. Actually, the reasons were pointed out right away before, just as he was coming in by his Latin American advisor, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, you know, supposedly way on the left. Uh, he led the Latin American mission, which informed Ken Kennedy that uh, the, what he said is the threat if Cuba is... Uh, the threat of the Castro idea of taking matters into your own hands, which might appeal to other people in the region who are suffering from similar problems, problems similar to those of the horribly oppressed uh, Cuban population in this, what had been an American colony. And if that idea spreads, well, you know, the dominoes start falling, and we can't accept that. Now, that version of the domino theory has never been questioned, and there's a good reason because it's correct. In fact, it's the core principle of intervention. Actually, the truth of the matter is that even the Cold War itself falls into that pattern. You go back to the, uh, you know, the, the, the concerns of Woodrow Wilson and Lloyd George and others at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. What they were concerned with was it, this was a third world country, you know, a huge country, but a deeply impoverished peasant society, basically a colony of Western Europe. And they were much concerned that uh, independent, successful development uh, in Russia might infect others. They were even concerned that it would affect Britain and the United States. And that's the reason for the immediate intervention. Kill the virus. Well, you know, Russia's a different scale than Grenada. 
Grenada you can get rid of in a weekend. Uh, Russia may take 70 years, but uh, that and, you know, threaten nuclear war and so on and so forth. But uh, those are issues of scale. The principles are the same. As for Kennedy being, look, of course Kennedy was carrying, like every president is always carrying out any number of back-channel efforts to see if there's some other way out of things. They'd be insane if they didn't. But we have a very rich record of the Kennedy administration. Actually, I wrote a book about it a few years ago which went through the whole documentary record. Uh, Kennedy was at the hawkish end of the administration. Without exception, he insists, he was, he wanted withdrawal, but so did they all. Nobody wanted to stay there. Uh, it was unpopular at home, it's crazy and so on. But every single case, it's always withdrawal after victory. Okay, so after we can ensure that our client regime can control South Vietnam, fine, then we'll withdraw. It's not like Iraq, we're going to stay. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of striking to look at the memoirs. I mean, there were memoirists, like Arthur Schlesinger, you know, wrote a thousand days. I mean, a deep, virtually a diary of every day of what happened, very close to Kennedy. Uh, Theodore Sorensen wrote a memoir. Uh, uh, Roger Hillsman wrote a memoir. You take a look at all his memoirs. There's not a hint about any plan for withdrawal, unless after victory. After the Tet Offensive, when the war became unpopular in the business world among elites, they all rewrote their memoirs. And in the new memoirs that come afterwards, it turns out Kennedy was a dove. You know, he was secretly trying this, that, and the other thing. Not a particle of evidence for it in the record. Uh, all the people who are later represented as doves, like Mike Mansfield, were, were complete hawks at the time. Just take a look back at the record. Now, the whole story was rewritten after the Tet Offensive. And by now there's a kind of, an, you know, an illusion being concocted that somehow uh, Kennedy was this uh, secret dove who was trying to do all kind of great things. Uh, and then this uh, vulgar Texan, Lyndon Johnson, came in and screwed it all up. Kennedy remembers one of us. He's one of the liberal intellectuals, the kind of guys who walk around Harvard Square. Uh, so he couldn't have been doing bad things. Uh, and I think that's the source of these, this imagery that's being concocted. But take a look at the record. It's very rich, not just in Vietnam, elsewhere as well. I mean, you know, take, say, Colombia, worst human rights record in the hemisphere for decades. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from a Kennedy uh, Special Forces mission, counter, counterinsurgency mission, headed by Special Forces General Yarborough in 1962, who advised the Colombian army to resort to what he called paramilitary terror to suppress uh, what are called known communist adherents. Well, you know, that means priests working with peasants, uh, labor activists, and so on. It was just like Vietnam. That's what they were using. That's Kennedy. You know, the, uh, it's nice to have illusions about uh, nice people like us, the kind we meet at dinner parties and so on, uh, as distinct from those awful people down in Texas and so on, like Johnson. But try to verify it. I, I don't like to take time from other questions, but let me add one quick thing. Uh, today is April 30th, and we talk about the end of the war in Vietnam. The, war, the U.S. war against Vietnam was fought and, you know, continually, continuously from 1975 up to very recently. You know, and now the United States thinks that, you know, it has forced the Vietnamese political elite, you know, to uh, uh, comply by its demands and so forth and so on. So it's okay, you know, to, uh, to have relations with Vietnam uh, for other reasons. But you know, let me mention, for example, April uh, 14, I mean, uh, not April, but uh, uh, May 14 of 1975, on the very day that Kissinger bombed May away, I mean, well, Cam Cam Cambodia on the May away thing, he ordered the Commerce and Treasury Department to impose a it's a strict embargo on both north and, and uh, the northern part of Vietnam and the southern part of Vietnam. You know, even though uh, one week before that, Prime Minister Phan Van Dong of Vietnam sent the United States a letter saying that, you know, uh, it, 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 that they wanted to have two independent countries in Vietnam, uh, you know, for the, and, and, and for 
foreseeable future, a neutral South Vietnam and North Vietnam. And Vietnam sent two delegations to, to the UN, you know, for the same reason applying to the UN. Uh, the U.S. ambassador to the UN uh, uh, blocked that, uh, say, and then he wrote, you know, later on his memoir that that was one way of, of, of continuing the war against Vietnam in other ways, and they wanted to force Vietnam, you know, to become one single country under communist so that they could use that to justify whatever uh, uh, policies they have in Southeast Asia and so on and so on. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that that domino theory thing uh, lasted long, many, many years after the end of the Vietnam, quote unquote, end of the Vietnam War. And now they see that the dominoes are safe now, you know, quote unquote. Unfortunately, we have to end at 1 p.m., and it's about three minutes of. So we'll take this one last question, but please keep it very brief. Uh, Professor Chomsky, I just want to take you back to uh, the beginning of your uh, talk. You uh, talk about your 1967 book uh, about responsibility of intellectual. Uh, I just want to ask you um, uh, that other people have um, follow up to talk about this topic. It was Said talk about uh, responsibility of intellectual in his BBC Rift lecture. And he pointed out uh, speaking truth to power. And I think reading subsequently, uh, you uh, kind of uh, give a qualification that it is a waste of time speaking truth to, to power. <laughs> uh, I would just want you to comment on, on your difference between CI on, on this topic. In addition to that, I, I would like, uh, in, in, embedded in your assumptions in the responsibility of intellectual, you, you're saying that in democratic society, uh, uh, there is much uh, less constraint for the intellectual class to, to expose uh, uh, lies that government do in the name of uh, the, 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 the nation, the, the, the population, and so on. Is, is this unique to United States, uh, taking you back to your Orwell's, George Orwell's problem you were formulating in the, around the 70s? Was Orwell's looking at this uh, intellectual class in the same way, or even back to Jonathan Swift, uh, looking at the relationship between England and, and Ireland and other writers who were writing English rule in, in, in Ireland. Uh, is there some evolution as we have been moving uh, the, the, and culminating seeing in the Iraq war uh, where this fact constraint is, is changing over time and intellectual can actually be more responsible and answer your question? Well, uh, Edward Said is an old and close friend of mine, and uh, actually I doubt that we disagreed about this. The question is what you mean by the phrase speaking truth to power. I mean, if you take it literally, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what's the point of speaking truth to uh, uh, McGeorge Bundy or Henry Kissinger? I mean, they know the truth, and they don't want to hear it from us. We have nothing to tell them. Uh, so speaking truth to power is a total waste of time. Uh, what doesn't, what isn't a waste of time is trying to tell the truth about power. Now, that makes sense. Uh, but then what you're doing is engaging with the general population and trying to become involved. And you don't speak truth to them either. After all, who the hell am I? Why should I tell truth to the population? What you try to do is what a good teacher does. You try to encourage people to figure it out for themselves and then do something about it. So what you should be doing is engaging with other people to try to get, use whatever, you know, f good fortune you have, maybe privilege, resources, training, whatever it may be, uh, to help them try to figure out the truth for themselves. Now, that makes sense, and get them to overthrow power, not to talk truth to it. Uh, so uh, as far as the history is concerned, I mean, there's kind of some real truisms. I mean, I hate to say them because they're so obvious. I mean, the more freedom and privilege you have, the more opportunity you have. Okay? Now, that's just elementary. The more opportunity you have, the more responsibility you have. Okay? And responsibility to do something useful with the privilege and uh, freedom that you enjoy. And we do enjoy an enormous amount of freedom and privilege. It was never given to us by the powerful. It was fought for by the powerless, and they won it. 
and they achieved it, and you've got to defend it, and you've got to use that legacy to go on. But the fact of the matter is that people like us are uniquely free and, uh, from op oppression. I mean, a lot of people complain about it, but the kind of repression that exists in places like this, uh, the United States, is minuscule as compared with what happens elsewhere in the world. I mean, take, say, U.S. colonies, okay? So we, we just, here's something else interesting about ourselves. Uh, we just passed the 25th anniversary of the assassination of uh, the Archbishop of El Salvador who was known as a voice for the voiceless. He was trying to speak for the poor. Uh, he was killed by forces you know, that we armed, armed and trained. He, that set off the beginning of a decade of monstrous atrocities in El Salvador, uh, run by the guys now in office, uh, which ended symbolically in 1989 by the murder of six leading intellectuals, Jesuit intellectuals, priests, uh, had their heads blown off by uh, elite military forces armed and trained and directed by the United States who had already compiled a record of, you know, killing tens of thousands of the usual victims, I mean, peasants, working people, and so on. How much commemoration was there in Cambridge of the 25th anniversary of the assassination of the archbishop and the 15th anniversary of the uh, uh, murder of six leading Latin American intellectuals? In fact, who in Cambridge could even tell you their names, I mean, let alone have read anything they wrote? Okay, now do a small thought experiment. Imagine that something like this had happened, to say, in Czechoslovakia. Okay, so in 1980, the archbishop was assassinated by Russian-backed forces, uh, and in 1989, Václav Havel and half a dozen of his associates uh, had their heads blown off by uh, uh, elite uh, Czech forces armed and trained by the Russians. Uh, would we know about it? You bet. Would there be a commemoration? I mean, you're screaming to the heavens. In fact, we could have had a nuclear war because we're so outraged by what they did. When we do it, it's gone. There was no, to my knowledge, there was no commemoration of any of this in Cambridge. There was in Boston, but not in Cambridge. Uh, there was in a church in downtown Boston. Uh, but you know, that's part of the difference between educated elites who are protected from knowledge and understanding. That's a large part of what education's about. And people who don't have those advantages of being defended from the truth and being indoctrinated. Uh, okay, that tells you something about intellectuals. The, sick, the Jesuit intellectuals who were murdered in El Salvador at our hands and the archbishop, the same, uh, they were... Uh, not speaking truth to power, they were trying to help people understand what was happening to them and do something about it. So they got their heads blown off. That's not going to happen to us. And the same is true in quite a few other countries in the world where intellectuals do not simply serve power and uh, uh, you know, support violence and terror, but actually protest against it, sometimes very bravely facing real serious repression. Uh, assassination, for example, or, you know, torture in prisons. I mean, the fact that we don't do it is just, you know, criminal. Uh, but there's, if to answer your other question, there's nothing new about that. I mean, the history of intellectuals is written by intellectuals, almost by definition. Uh, so therefore, it, it's pretty, it sounds pretty. You know, like if you had a history of taxi drivers written by taxi drivers, that would sound pretty too. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, can we believe the history of themselves written by intellectuals? Well, in order to answer that question, you have to look at the facts. Right. And it turns out the facts are quite different. Overwhelmingly, intellectuals have been servants of power. There's always some kind of fringe of dissidence. And that goes back, you know, that goes back as far as you want. And furthermore, we all know it. We may not notice it, but we all know it. So go back to the. We've run out of time. Pardon? Uh, well, yeah, who were on the fringe and were killed. Okay. But, we are out of time. I'm I'm sorry. We could probably go on and on, but unfortunately, the program is on a tight schedule. I, I, Perhaps I, there will be time to talk later. Let's have a round of applause for more time. For
the program continues at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Please come back and see the film The Coochie Tunnels which, and meet the filmmaker that will be screened on the third floor of the Student Center at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Thank you for attending. <laughs>